Hi, this is Tom DeWitt from TDW and DreamWalkers, Inc., and you're listening to the Brutally Delicious Podcast. Oh, yeah. Hey, welcome to the Brutally Delicious Podcast. I'm Bruce. Oh, and I am Rena. <laughs> I was giving Chris the opportunity. You can tell it's the end of the day. I don't think I'm doing the so- for, show solo now. For all of those people that just heard that clink, that's Rena getting wasted <laughs> while she's doing the podcast. We are a booze-friendly podcast. So, yes. So we allow our employees... <laughs> <laughs> Wow, now. <laughs> we don't pay them. It's kind of like slave labor, but <laughs> our interns. <laughs> They're interns. <laughs> the she's she's the only thing that keeps course. this thing going. But you know, one of the perks is our interns are allowed to drink. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm only safe from sexual harassment because I'm in <laughs> <laughs> I think we're the ones that get sexually harassed the most. Though. I think mostly. I mean, you said tit in the last interview. I did, though. But it was <laughs> a bird. <laughs> At any rate, today we're going to be talking with our friend Tom DeWitt uh, from Dreamwalkers. I don't know. We've talked to him before. He's always a nice guy. And if you want to hang on, we'll grab him. Let's do it. He's our Perfect. first repeat customer. No, no. We had Josh from... Uh, Oculum Day. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. I forgot. Sorry. Sorry. It's it's nice when people like, you know, have know what we're doing and then actually want to come back and join us. Yeah. I noticed yeah. I noticed we haven't had Riley from the Legion. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce, it's, it's really hard to leave a, a, a like abusive relationship. So I guess so. Tom. <laughs> Tom. Hey, Hello. Tom. How are you? Hello there. Can you hear me well like this? Yeah. Well, yes, we can. Welcome back. Hello. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Hi. <laughs> yeah. We were just talking that not many people, we didn't think many people would want to rejoin us. So that's, it's pretty nice you did. Oh, well, that is, that is interesting because you're actually one of the first on my list. I was like, yeah, I should talk to those guys again. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. How you, how you been doing? Uh, yeah, well, incredibly busy, actually. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of weird because obviously, um, co- with COVID hitting the world and, and everyone's lives basically either going for a 180 into being more busy or not busy at all. Um, it kind of feels like I kind of have to keep going to, you know, to actually, uh, keep, keep myself afloat. But weirdly enough, that is also a blessing in disguise. Because it kind of, you know, kind of keeps me sane, if you know what I mean. Because there's so much weird shit going on that I don't have any control over. So oh, if yeah. I just, so if I just work really hard, and you know, right now with the new album, but also just in general, then I at least feel some sort of accomplishment at the end of the day. Like, hey, at least I did this. You know, that that kind of feeling. That's awesome. Oh, Chris, you still there? I'm still here. Yeah. Oh. So. What have you been doing in your downtime? Well, I mean, um, it, it's it's kind of weird because um, it's it's actually it's in that sense it's a weird kind of coincidence because at the end of last year, like way before uh, all of COVID hit us, I was actually already working on uh, the live album for Dreamwalkers Inc., which we talked about the other time we talked, you yeah, know, in early May when yeah. I went. Yeah, so that was like a thing that I was already working on, and I was working on the album that I'm releasing now in December. So, in a way, on a musical perspective, I've just been—I I basically just kept working on that. And I'm, of course, lucky that I have the studio in my house, so I can just yeah, yeah. So I can I can basically keep working. So I just kept going. And weirdly enough, there's been many situations that there were people telling me like, "Oh man, I cannot." do anything I'm, I'm creatively stunted or i'm just not able to you know to record something properly and this is one of the few times that I actually felt like okay i am very lucky for having this you know there, there there's a lot of downsides to being your own boss at times but yeah that that actually kind of saved me during this whole weird covid situation that's pretty fantastic rena mm-hmm. you back hi yes hey sir. Tom, last time Tom, last time you were here, we didn't have Rena with us, but we've got a we've added another partner. Rena, oh, meet Tom. 
Hi, Tom. Nice to meet you. Hi, Rena. Nice to meet you, too. Hi. <laughs> it's, uh... No, we're a pick from Finland on this podcast, too. Oh, awesome. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, the, it's, it's all, in that sense, Skype is magical, right? Like, just being able to connect to everyone, that is really cool. At least yeah. I think so. Absolutely. And I just love how I ended up on this podcast. Like, these guys... <laughs> <laughs> did an interview with with me for my band's album release and it went completely off the rails <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and we, uh, one of us made a comment we should have her on as a guest <laughs> as a guest host and she's like yeah sure and then we can't get rid of her now right now no. she's trying to take over no uh -huh. i'm here now <laughs> we but you want to hear something cool we just made a new company policy are you ready for this Okay, sure. bring it. People it, are it, allowed to drink while they're on the podcast. That is, uh, as, especially in these trying times, that is a policy I can get behind, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why I love the whole, like, trying times couple of words, you know. Like, it's, it's been so extremely overused in every single piece of copy. And he <laughs> comes I know. Well, that, trying times. Also <laughs> unprecedented. Actually, uh, to be fair, I'm just literally referencing it's always sunny in Philadelphia. You know, like, do you want an egg in these trying times? You know, that, that, that's what I'm aiming for here in this case. <laughs> just a very bad reference. I love that show, by the way. So <laughs> are you keeping the direction for this new record that you're going to be releasing the same? Or have you changed it anyway? What, how did you approach trying to keep it fresh? Um, well... In a way, it's like, um, because obviously with Dreamwalkers Inc., that's more of a band thing, even though that started out, you know, from my own project. But that has kind of become its own thing. And this is very much a TDW record. So it's oh, very much a person. So this, this is like a solo record. It's not a Dreamwalkers Inc. thing. Um, and in this case, the reason why it's really different is because I'm basically now making a solo album about the most personal thing I've ever been through. And I've put that to music. And um, the, like it's a concept record about what happened to me 11 years ago. And uh, I mean, by now I'm not secretive about this anymore, but I'll just throw it out there. I have been in, um, I've had quite a heavy bowel disease when I was uh, 19 years old. And I, I fought and struggled with that until I was 22. And I've spent extensive time in hospitals around that time as well. Like, you know, oh, wow. far more than would be uh, healthy for you in whatever way and basically it is something I'm, I'm an ostomy patient now i have a handicapped body because of it a lot of stuff has happened in that era and basically what i did now after 11 years of not really talking about this and like, like i wasn't really hiding it as much that i just didn't feel like talking about it in music or in general because i kind of felt like I don't know. I wasn't ready, I guess. I, I just wasn't ready to, to openly speak about the fact like, yeah, you know, I'm handicapped. Right. It, it, this is real. This is, this is a thing now, <laughs> you know, and it has been a thing obviously for all my life, but I just wasn't ready. And now I felt I was ready. And the album basically is what it was like to be a 19 year old, uh, well, kid basically, and suddenly being confronted with a body that just shuts down on you. And, you know, what happens when you almost die, you know, what, what happens to, to the way you perceive life and all the things that follow into it. And the album title is The Days the Clock Stopped, which is basically what it felt like. It's like for three years of my life, I felt like I was on standby because I was sick. You know, the right. whole world was building a life, making a career, doing all the things that you do when you're in your early 20s. And I was sick. Yeah. That, that, and that's basically what I what I try to express in this record. And it's a very it's obviously a concept album, very dark, very moody. I've heard a few people say that it was a bit like a punch to the gut, if you know what I mean, because it's it's very raw, very real. I'm not I'm not necessarily uh, putting stuff in there for shock value, but some pretty shocking stuff happened then for most people when they listen to it, you know, with an, um, without any pre knowledge. Did you find writing this record to be super therapeutic? Well, you know, yes, in a way, yes, of course. Yeah, because it's like, um, but, but to be fair, I mean, we talked about that earlier in the, um, with the Dreamwalkers Inc. thing as well. It's like, for me, music always is therapy because it's like there's there's just stuff that you can talk about with others, but then it won't take away the emotional load that you're feeling. And especially in my case, being highly sensitive and all that. So it's like, 
writing a song about it works better than talking about it in a way, because then I can actually give it the emotional weight that it needs. And well, obviously this is something that has quite some emotional weight. Right. So then, then you, you don't just write one song. You, it needed to be an album in itself because I felt like, okay, if I want to do this right, not, and I wasn't even thinking about making it an album originally. I just started writing music about this and then it kind of became this record. And then it was like, oh, 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 okay. Oh, this is an album now. Okay, right. <laughs> because originally right. I wasn't even sure what it was going to be. Wasn't even sure if I was going to release it. You know, you know what I find really interesting about this? And I'm not trying to generalize or anything, but this is about what the third or fourth interview we've had today where mm-hmm. COVID has kind of forced people to look inward a lot more. Yes. And and to kind of tackle demons because they were forced to do you- yeah yeah I, I can see what you mean sorry, sorry to interrupt you on no, that it's... i can see what you mean um but i do have to put well like i said i have to put one pin in that is that i was actually already working on this album in 2017 like i've literally been working on this for the last few years and i do think in my case it's like COVID helped because i was here anyway <laughs> so I might right. as well, you know, fin- finish the record and, and, and make it happen, you know. So, but it was more, I, I think, I get it though. Like, I think it's a very valid observation you're making there. But in my case, it's like, this was already bubbling underneath the surface and it was already happening. It's just that, yeah, because obviously all the work that I originally had kind of fell through in March. And uh, when the lockdown happened here in the Netherlands, you know, when everything started out here. Right. And and I just kind of knew that, OK, I'm already working on this album. And by that point, I already had the album done for about 70 percent. So when we were working on the Dreamwalkers record, I already felt like, OK, I might as well just finish the solo album now as well, because th- if if there's any time, this this kind of feels like it's a sign. You know what I mean? It's like, OK, now you're you're giving this time to finish this record. OK, then you should do it now. You know, so that that's kind of how that went. But I, I do think the the in, the introspective side of it, like finding um, finding the inner motivation to make this record, I think that actually already happened in 2017. But I just didn't have the balls to instantly chase it, so to speak, <laughs> because, because it was just so daunting. You know, it's like, OK, I'm going to talk about the thing that I'm scared of the most. That's right. Uh, not scary at all. You know? I, I think you should give communication classes. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> I, I want to know, like you mentioned that you're highly sensitive, as am I. So, like, do, at least for me, the whole, like, being highly sensitive means that, that you take on and, and like, um, take in a lot more information than the average person does, which means that you will have to sort of um, regroup also a lot more and, and re, oh, like, yeah. it, it just... Absolutely. That, that time of rebooting for yourself so now that it's been covid do you think you've had just like more energy to concentrate on the music because you don't have to concentrate on just getting back to a normal level after being in a crowd for instance yeah but this is a, this is a good point you're making there i i do yeah i think that's partially the truth though at the same time it's like i i would say I'm I'm introvert by nature, so that's also why I like working by myself. I'm I'm fine with being in that sense alone. Yet at the same time, there's always like some chat window open somewhere to at least have some human interaction. You know what I mean? But it's like um, I don't know. I I think in general, the I do. Uh, yes, I agree with that. That the recharging time is nice. That you know that I'm able to put uninterrupted focus in things. That is very nice and very needed as well. But at the same time, I also know that I do need to be with the people that I love and, you know, be, albeit band members, friends, etc. Um, because that gives me a different kind of energy. You know, yeah. It, it, yeah. Gives, it, it gives as well. Sort of like referring to just the like everyday strains of going to a supermarket or, or just being a, in, on a street with a lot of people. Which Absolutely. is, you know, like now probably there aren't as many people on the street. Oh, yeah. No, no. But it's 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 odd. Like, I, I agree with you in that sense that it definitely that's something I recognize. And that is definitely the case with me. It's also that I think weirdly enough, and this is something that I've been pondering now that I've been working on this record. And now, like right now, I'm promoting the album. But obviously, the album's been done for months now. And, you know, then obviously you start looking back on it a bit. And the thing is that. 
I think because, weirdly enough, because I had been highly sensitive the first 19 years of my life, that was like my main struggle, my high sensitivity, trying to find out how that worked and thinking that I was crazy for feeling all the stuff that I felt every day. Right. And when I was like 18 years old, then I actually found a psychiatrist who was gracious and great enough to tell me like, hey, you're not crazy. This is actually something that is very explainable. And if you just take your time to recharge, then you can, you know, you, you can perfectly function fine. And obviously, th that is obviously very easily stated. It's very hard to live with it at times. But b basically, the moment when I found out that my high sensitivity was a thing, and I was like, okay, I might now have the tools to deal with this. That's when I got physically sick. So, bas so basically, right. it's like, you know, I tend to calculate, I tend to, to categorize my life like first 18 years. Yeah, that was my mental war. And then the three years of physical war happened. And then there was this five years of, I would say, semi depression slash just trying to find my footing again. And now, well, obviously, my career, weirdly enough, my career, my music career all happened while I already was handicapped and having my ostomy and everything. So when people saw me on stage, when they saw me perform, I would literally have my moments of running to the side of the stage to make sure that my ostomy was still in place, you know, right. and, and people just wouldn't see it. Yeah. And, and because obviously I didn't, like I said, I wasn't secretive about it. If someone would see it by accident and would ask me, I would be honest. I would never lie about it. But it's like for me, living my life with a body that basically is broken is my norm. And yeah. I, I got some people saying afterwards that, that, that for example, with gigs, like, um, I mean, I'm not sure how that is for you, uh, Rina, but for me, it's like touring is one thing that I would kind of like to do. And on the other hand, I just can't because if I play one gig, I need three days of recovery. Right. Because I just have the body that I have and I'm also highly sensitive. So it's like, yeah. you know, you're being assaulted mentally and physically at such an occasion. Yet I do really like performing. So I have a weird love hate relationship with with all those things happening at the same time. It's like basically on paper, it doesn't make sense that I want to be a performing musician because all the odds are against me. <laughs> right. I know, but I applaud you for like overcoming all those struggles and doing it anyways, because that's that's the thing. Like, you know, like I, I deal with depression, anxiety, all those like, you know, social awkwardness, social ears, you know, all these sort of things that, you know, come in the way. And then you just have to fucking plow through and do it anyways. And I think like as musicians, as, as people who have a compelling need to create something, yeah. we don't really have a choice because like if we do not do those things, no matter how hard they are, we will just shrivel up and die, basically, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it's, it's like um, the need to, I wouldn't say project because that is, that is a more negative term, but, but I do think that the need to put those emotions that you can't really use anywhere else into something that is actually constructive is... Well, I think a lot of people have that. It's, you know, one of the biggest misconceptions with high sensitivity. I can imagine that it sounds a bit like, like, oh, look at him being special or whatever. It's like high sensitivity doesn't mean that your brain works differently. It's just that your filter is broken. You know, it's like most people probably subconsciously go through the same things that we see. They notice the same things, but they're just able to say, you know what? I'm not feeling this now. <laughs> that, that's that's ba that's how I tend to see it. And. <laughs> That, like I read the Elaine Aaron who's done like all the research and, and written books on the highly sensitive person. And she does mm. say that it is a, a brain functioning differently, that it's actually found in animals as well, that, you know, that you will have in a pack of deers, there will be a couple um, highly sensitive deers and, and they will then like, you know, their brain does collect more information than the other <laughs> deers or the other people's in our cases. So I think there is like, you know, some sort of different brain function going on, but yeah, I've never yeah, exactly. It. But it's like you can you can see that in two ways. It's like I don't I I prefer to think of it like um, because for years, for example, I always thought, okay, so I'm apparently crazy because I'm feeling all this stuff that no one else is feeling, and I'm you know my brain is giving me a hard time. So the first thing that you tend to do is internalize, and it's like, oh, I'm crazy then, and yeah. the fact that someone actually told me like no you're not like like it makes sense it's it's annoying and and you know you might have some struggles with it but it does make sense it's not weird that you're feeling these things yeah. that helped so much completely yeah i know i i only 
found out about this thing uh, as as well, like after I had already been in a mental institute, like suicidal laptop for a month and and like yeah. and all of that like has to do with the sense of being crazy like there's something wrong with me because i can't handle the world like other people can handle it you know yeah so exactly yeah you do blame yourself and i completely understand the relief that you've gotten when somebody told you that no no you just got this trait yeah, and, it, and it's like, and what it was is for me, it was like, um, because I've never, I've never been secretive. For example, like I have medication, which actually helps me and I'm happy that it helps me because, Hey, I function and, and that helps. But yeah. it's also like, I know that there's so many, so many different types and forms and shapes, you know, it's like what works for me doesn't have to mean that it worked for someone else. But I think if to put it back to the uh, to the point that um, that was made earlier about COVID being a you know actually forcing people to look inward, I think that weirdly enough, the one of the blessings of COVID weirdly enough is because people had to look inward. There's there will always be people who just don't care, and you know whatever you, you'll never be able to win those. But I've noticed that there were quite a few people around me who I didn't expect it. Who actually became more aware of these kind of things who actually told me like hey you know because of this whole situation i'm starting to see how you're feeling and weirdly enough it might have brought some people together in a way as well even though obviously it would have been nice if that happened in a different way as opposed to through to a, to a pandemic but still right. it's like it would have been nice if we had that without the pandemic that would be great yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, um, Tom, mm -hmm. I'm going to interrupt for a second. If people no, want to find find your new material, um, where can they go do the so? Well, um, uh, if you search uh, the first uh, music video is already out for uh, for one of the singles. Uh, it's called uh, Death and Her Brother Greg. It's a weird title, but I did that on purpose because it stands out. Um, That's great. Mm -hmm. I love that. It's really cool. <laughs> And and that is actually a pretty scary video because well, there's a certain point where I'm covered in where I'm almost covered in wires, fake blood, and I'm just standing there, in my underpants, and everything is visible. And it, it, there were a few people watching that, like, okay, that's a confrontational image. I'm like, yeah, that's what I went through. There you go. You know, right. I, I can I cannot make it more clear than this. You know, there you go. Um, but basically, what I'm doing right now is the album is coming on the. Uh, the 4th of December, and what I started was a pre-order campaign through my own website. And at uh, tdwmusic.com, you can pre-order the album, and I made, like, tiers. So people can, for example, donate this much, they get the record digitally. Uh, order this much, they get the physical copy, yada, 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 all the way up until the highest tier, which means that I'll write people a song. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, nice. and there were a few, a few people already did that, so... Fun fact, the next TDW album is happening in 2021 because I have to write people songs now. <laughs> <laughs> so that is kind of cool, you know. It, 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 it's the gift that keeps on giving in a weird way. You know, it's like, okay, sure, <laughs> let's do that then. Hey, give out, give out that address, Tom. Give out those places where people can find you. Okay, um, well, the first one is uh, www.tdwmusic.com. So that is uh, that's the main website, and the music video is on there. The pre-order shop is there. You, it all speaks for itself. Um, you can find the Facebook page at uh, TDW Music, and you can find me on Facebook at TDW Prog, and also my Instagram is TDW Prog and TDW Prog on Twitter as well. And that was one of the things that I started doing recently. I got more active on Twitter again because that was something that I kind of neglected. It, it's not a big thing here in the Netherlands, unfortunately, but. I noticed that there's a lot of really cool musicians on there and I do want to connect. So yeah, hook me up, you know? Awesome. Sounds cool. great. Hey, oh, thanks yeah. for sharing so openly. Yeah. I mean, it's not, now's the time for it, I guess, you know, the album's here, nothing to hide. There you go. That's <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. Chris. I don't have anything else, man. Thanks again for joining us today. Yeah. That was pretty yeah. fantastic. Can and I don't say your honesty. <laughs> thank you, my friend. <laughs> thank you, my friend. I really appreciate you taking the time again. No problem. I love I love being being uh, being a guest with you guys. And uh, you know, if you ever, if you ever need me for for random stuff, then you can always hit me up. No problem. <laughs> awesome. I appreciate it. You be safe and take care of yourself. Yeah. You too. Care, hey, talk friend. to you later. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Bye. Later. Bye. Bye. 
Ever wonder what a punch from Elton John feels like? Or how you'd cope with having turned down the chance to be in Nirvana? Or what signal Keith Richards gives when he wants you to get the hell out of his hotel room? Fans of Too Much Effie Perspective don't have to wonder, because they've heard these exact stories and a jillion others on our podcast. I'm Alex Hoffman, former tour manager for Radiohead. And I'm musician and comedy writer Alan Keller. On the TMEP show, we get guests like Nancy Wilson from Heart, Jeremiah Freights from the Lumineers, and Modern Family's Julie Bowen to tell us things they may have only shared with their therapist, clergy, or a TMZ stringer. So join us on Too Much Effing Perspective. That's E-F-F-I-N-G Perspective. The only podcast you crank up to 11. Oh.